Well, good morning. I want to thank all of you all for being with us this morning for another study of what saith the Lord. And we are glad that you are here this morning and have chosen to worship with us. Prayer is the avenue of communication between God and man. From time to time in the scriptures, you will find instances of where God has spoken to man about prayer. Someone will give a prayer or an oration or a speech to the Lord, and he will respond back in turn with a verbal affirmation or a statement via an angel or a messenger or even Jesus himself to someone's answer to a prayer. However, in the book of Colossians, we find many types of prayers in the book of Colossians. Tonight, we will be looking at our scripture reading, which was the prayer of Paul, and we will also talk about the prayer of the Colossians. But this morning, what I would like to talk about is a prayer in the book of Colossians from a man by the name of Epaphras. When we look at this man, we are looking at a Gentile preacher We are looking at a man who prayed in Colossians chapter 4. So if you will turn with me to Colossians chapter 4 and study with me the prayer of Epaphras. Colossians was a book written to the the brethren at Colossae and their location was close to a region that we would call today Well, today the country would be Turkey or Asia Minor. And one of the congregations that was in the area was a church by the name of Laodicea, which you may be familiar with in the book of Revelation as being a church that was called a lukewarm church or a church that was neither cold nor hot in the sense that the book of Revelation was written to the Laodiceans. We learned that those brethren were uh, neutral and were not on fire for the Lord or zealous for the Lord, nor were they cold-hearted, but just going through the motions. It's interesting when we get to the book of Colossians that you're turning to now in Colossians 4, that the book of Revelation that was written to the Laodiceans was told to be read to the Colossian brethren as well. But yet Laodicea was to also receive this book that was to the church at Colossae. The scriptures read that now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle or letter from Laodicea. I take that to be Revelation. It says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. As we look at the conclusion of the book of Colossians, and we see that he was writing in bonds or from a place wherein he was chained, we learn also of this other man, Epaphras, this less studied individual that is also just as important in the kingdom of the Lord. We are going to look at one particular verse and do what's called a text study or a textual study as we look at one particular section of Colossians 4, and analyze the five points that we learn in a five-fold prayer to the Colossian Christians. You've probably heard a song that's called a seven-fold amen, where they say amen, amen, amen in the song. This is a five-fold prayer. In Colossians chapter 4 and in the 12th verse, we learn of the prayer of Epaphras. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you. I don't think that just means he's a Christian. I think that means he's Colossian. Epaphras, who is one of you. Epaphras, the Colossian, who is one of you. He is a bondservant of Christ. In other words, he's a preacher. He's a minister. He has devoted himself to the service of preaching the gospel. He says, this Colossian preacher, the one that would be of you, I want to tell you what he has to say. You may have heard apostles give information. You may have heard information from men like Peter and Paul. But I want to tell you about one of your own. 
I want you to know about someone from your local church where I'm in chains here in, in prison as he's writing this letter. He says, Epaphras, a Colossian, a preacher says this, I greet you. I want you to know, I want you to know, I say hello to all of you. I greet you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand complete and perfect in all the will of God. For I bear him witness, New King James Version, that he has a great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea, once again, mentioning that he cares for all the churches. The preachers often in the first century times, as in other places, they didn't just necessarily labor with one particular church, but they labored for the church. They would preach in various places. We have a gospel meeting coming up next week, and we have a man who will be preaching uh, who is from Kansas City. And he will be preaching where he preaches usually, but he's coming here to visit us here. He's part of the church. He's part of the universal body. So he's going to preach for us. And he is a member of the church. And so he cares about the church as we all preachers care about the church. But here this particular Colossian Epaphras was one who also cared about those in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis or Hierapolis. And then he also mentions Luke, the beloved physician, but we're going to focus on Epaphras. When we look at these ideas that he mentions here, the New King James Version mentions the idea that he was one who was a preacher, a bondservant. Uh, he was one that is from uh, Coloss Colossae. But it also says he's always laboring for you fervently. Those aren't necessarily words I use all the time. With I say always, and I say laboring, but I don't usually use the word fervently. So when we look that word up in the dictionary, or it's cross-references passages in various scriptures, we find that that's the idea of wrestling. The idea of fervent wrestling for them. The New International Version go ahead and goes ahead and translates it that way. You may have an NIV with you on a seat in front of you, and you'll see where it says, he wrestled in prayer for them, which is a kind of an interesting way of looking at this. Isn't it nice to know that these Christians we're receiving a letter from an apostle, but he's saying not just the apostles, but also a fellow Christian just like you. He's wrestling in prayer for you. He's not just saying, please be with the church at Colossae. Please be with the church at Laodicea. Please be with the church at Hierapolis. I am a robot. No, he didn't say it like that. He wrestled with them. He said, I am, uh, there's brethren here that I care about. There's brethren here that I care about. And I'm pleading with them that they will be able to stay strong in the faith at the time when they're, when they're, they're undergoing persecution. And I want them to be uh, all, all for the Lord and not to give up, not to be lukewarm, not to be complacent, but to be firm in the Lord. Have you ever prayed a prayer? And you've prayed a prayer, and within the prayer, you quote Scripture to yourself. I've done this. You, you're thinking of a Scripture, and you think to yourself in a private prayer, that Scripture explains to God better than what I'm trying to say. That I'm dealing with a certain circumstance, and in dealing with that, God has already given an answer or a wording to the challenge that I sometimes get. When God gives a word like that, we sometimes go to His word to try to figure something out. When we can't word it ourselves, we go to His words and we try to say, Lord, you have written this phrase. I want that phrase to be active in my life and I want to obey your word in a better way. I wrestle with the text. I wrestle and I work with your words because I want to be better and I want to be more glorious in your sight. He wrestled in prayer for the Colossians. What did he wrestle for? That they might stand firm. It's easy to get knocked off your feet when you're off balance. It's easy to fall. It's easy to get injured if you're leaning one way or the other. And yet at the same time, he's wanting them to stand firm. He's wanting them to be grounded and firmly planted in the faith. This whole sermon, this entire sermon comes from one verse. 
You'd say, you're preaching a one-verse sermon? Yeah, look what all's in it. He wrestled in prayer for the Colossians, and then he prayed for them to stand firm. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, we sometimes sing. We, we talk about Paul in his writings to Timothy, where he says, guard the trust, O Timothy. Stand firm, where he says, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which you've delivered until that day. He stand firm. I know who I've believed. I know who Jesus Christ is. I know there is a Lord. I believe in him. And here's my prayer for you. Don't waver. Don't concede one inch in doctrine. Focus on knowing what's true and believe what's true and stay firm in the faith. How many times have people said, well, I like this over here because it appeals to me better? I said, well, do you believe what they say doctrinally over there better? No. I just like it better because it's easier for me to listen to. That's not what he's talking about. He's praying that they will stand firm in the faith. He also prayed for a specific thing with their firmness. He prayed that their firmness would be in all the will of the Lord. Well, they teach on this topic, but they don't teach on that topic. He preaches about this, but he doesn't preach about that. Paul said, For three years in one place I have not shunned to teach unto you the whole counsel of the will of the Lord. He doesn't teach portions of the Scripture. He teaches all the Scripture. Now, granted, I get that a preacher can't give the whole Bible in one sermon. <laughs> Some people, I think, they expect too much of the preacher. They want him to teach on every subject, in every way, in every form, in every lesson. Uh, like it's supposed to say in every lesson something about authority or something about some particular topic, dancing, marriage, divorce, remarriage. Well, you can have individual sermons on each one of those things. You can give a sermon series on authority or moral issues or a sermon on uh, divorce and marriage. You can give all sorts of sermons in various ways. You don't have to try to impress upon everybody everything at all one time because then it becomes so much of an amalgamation of goo that you can't process everything that's mentioned. You can't just simply talk about everything in every sermon. But at the same time, you can pray for the brethren that they would be in all the will of the Lord. We have a Bible that we can read outside of services as well. He, at this time, was giving information to Colossian brethren when they only had portions of the will of the Lord. Because he's writing this, right? They don't have the whole Bible with them. And so he's praying that as the Bible is developing, they will stay true to the written text. He's talking to infants. He's talking to the primary infants in the faith. He's talking to them and he says, don't waver. There will be some people like Judaizing teachers who will say things like the resurrection is already passed. They will say things like Christ Jesus has already come. People like Hymenaeus and Philetus who are of that sort. And he was saying, don't waver in sort of false doctrines that you hear from time to time. He says, I want to pray for you that your firmness will be in not just parts of the will of the Lord, but all the will of the Lord. As we grow and develop in the faith, we need to mature. Uh, the idea of maturing is mentioned a number of times in the scriptures. And uh, when we look at the the principles that are mentioned in the scriptures, we can learn uh, a lot about maturity. I, let's, let's go back just for a second on the last slide. I want to sc scroll back to what's one, one slide here, where it says, uh, he prayed that their firmness would be in all the will of the Lord. He says in Hebrews 13, don't be carried about with various strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. He then says, not with foods which have no profit to those who have been occupied with them. He says in verse 9, he says, don't be carried away or tossed about or moved or drifting with various strange doctrines. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear, verse 6. 
That's what we need to boldly say. When it comes to doctrines and comes to difference, differences and things that different ones want to tell us in certain religious directions, some people want us to go to the left and some people want us to go to the right. He says, follow the straight and narrow path that leads to, to, to heaven. And he says, the Lord will be your helper. You need not fear because God can help you. And so what we need to know is that not only did he pray for them to do what was right and be firm in the truth, but to mature. That's the segue. He prayed for them to mature in the faith. Part of maturity is being able to decipher between a false doctrine and a true doctrine. Part of maturity is being able to do that. He says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, strengthen the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. He mentions in Hebrews chapter 12 the idea of the strengthening that we have in the faith. And he mentions that, and he talks about that as we look towards uh, the development of our faith. He says in Hebrews chapter 12, 1, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. That's what sin does. It easily ensnares. And so he's saying, lay aside those sinful weights which easily entangle us, and then run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before us endured the cross, and despising the shame has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's saying, run the race. He's saying mature. He's saying develop. He's saying take sins and cast it off. Take righteousness and press on towards righteousness. The prayer of Epaphras. We don't study very often the prayer of Epaphras. But listen to how bold this is. He says, brethren, I'm not just praying for you. I'm wrestling with God for you. Do you remember that passage of Scripture where uh, I, I think it was Jacob? He wrestled with an angel all night. He wrestled all night with an angel. He's out there wrestling with him. They pop out his hip, hip socket, and he says, you got a new name. Your new name is Israel. You will no longer be called Jacob. And he goes, I've been wrestling with God's angel all night, and I didn't even know it. He's like, yeah, he wrestled with him. We sometimes do the same thing, don't we? But do we wrestle for the right reasons? We need to be wrestling in such a way that we strive to tell the Lord we really want others to be saved. And we want our Christian brethren to stand firm in the faith and not waver one inch in doctrine, but to be fully committed to devoted and righteously filled with the scriptures in their life. He prayed that they'd stand firm. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, For put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace and having that shield that is able to quench all the darts of the evil one and having finally the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says, having put on and the helmet of salvation. Having all those things, he says, you gird yourself and you get ready. But he says, you're wrestling against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against our own people. We're fighting with our people against the devil. For we get wrestle against flesh, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and cosmic places and high places. We go and, and we follow the Lord and we put on the whole armor of God so that we can be able to stand. Epaphras talked like that. You say, well, those were Paul's words in Ephesians. But Epaphras talked like that in Colossians. He just said it with a lot less words. <laughs> he said, I'm praying not just for the Christian to be girded with salvation, not just for the Christian to put on the pa plan of panoply or armor of God, but for them also to essentially just do the same thing. Paul may have used many more words where Epaphras just said three, stand firm, brethren, or I pray that you stand firm. That's what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to not fall when the devil tried to push him down. 
that they'd have be anchored in Jesus, that they'd stand firm. And he prayed that their firmness would be in all the will of the Lord, and he prayed for them to mature. He also prayed for them to be fully assured. Fully assured. Look at Colossians chapter 4, in that 12th verse that we're studying, where he says, Epaphras, who's one of you, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand complete or firm in all the will of God, being fully assured in all the will of God. I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you. Standing firm in all the will. Full assurance. Fully convinced. We are God's people. We are God's brethren. But He doesn't want us to drift. He wants us to stay firm and be fully convinced in what we teach and preach. Well, what about our prayer for you? So that's what Epaphras prayed for those in Colossae. What about our prayer for you? You know, today's Mother's Day. A lot of people say, well, is he going to do a Mother's Day sermon? No. I think all mothers would want you to serve God and do what God wants you to do. And we all together would pray for you to be firm in all the word of truth and to develop spiritual maturity and to be fully convinced. But we all want you to know this. If you're not a Christian, we often wrestle in prayer to God for you. We don't fight against God, but we often ask God, why hasn't so-and-so become a Christian? In our private prayers, we say we really would hope we can say something or do something that would help so-and-so know that we want them to be saved and we want them to go to heaven and we want them to know that I know with full assurance in whom I place my trust and I know that I am convinced that He is God and I want them to have the same uh, ability to go to heaven and the same faith and the same uh, recognition of a great glorious God who loves them and saves them and sent Jesus to die for them. And we often pray in a very wrestled tones to those who are drifting, who maybe they're Christians, but maybe they only come to services uh, on occasion, or maybe they just, they're just, it's not that they don't believe in God. They've just uh, got so much stuff in the world that's causing them to compete for their time. And, and we want them to know, well, we're missing you and want you to be part of the faith and, and be part of the work here. And for that, we pray that they may be restored to the faith. But to those that aren't Christians, we often say, well, we're wrestling in prayer, just like Epaphras was wrestling in prayer for his Colossian brethren. He wrestled for his church to grow. He wrestled for his church to stand firm. He wrestled for Christ's church because really the firmness is in Christ and not Epaphras. Notice he didn't say, do all these things for me. He said, mature in the Lord. He said, stand firm in the Lord. He said he wanted them to develop and be fully what they could be for the Lord. In Colossians 4, he was in prison with Paul. And this five-fold prayer that he gave to the Colossian Christians speaks to so much discussion of what could be said of us. As we stand firm in the faith, in all the will of the Lord, and grow and mature, be fully assured that if you do that, you can develop in the ways God wants you to develop. This has just been a lesson on prayer from one particular verse, talking about Epaphras, uh, one we don't talk about as much from the Scriptures, uh, some of you may not have even known Epaphras was a Bible character. That's Some of you just may not have known that. Uh, but he was a Colossian preacher who had a lot to say in one, one small verse. And uh, Paul will discuss his prayer tonight as well as the Colossians' prayer tonight. And we'll look at those things as well. And if you have faith in Jesus and you believe Jesus is the Son of, the, of, Son of God, please confess Him, repent of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and live for Jesus. Now, why are you waiting?
Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If we can help you become a Christian this morning through repentance and baptism, please come forward as we stand and sing.